On today's show, the biggest questions and storylines heading into Houston Rockets Media Day for the 2022-2023 season. Revisiting some of those storylines, what are the expectations overall for Rockets Media Day? Plus, we take a look at the futures of both Eric Gordon and KJ Martin. All of that coming up right here at Lockdown Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select... Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. You get somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as Rockets Watch. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. We are free and available on all podcast platforms, including YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. It's exciting times because we are basically right on the precipice of being back to Houston Rockets basketball action in full swing. Media Day is here. What are the expectations for Media Day? We're going to run through some of the things to expect out of Media Day coming Monday at 11 a.m. Central Time. We're going to talk about some of the biggest storylines and questions going into Houston Rockets Media Day, but also going into the season. We're not expecting all these questions and storylines to be answered in one afternoon of, you know, press, you know, press related questions and whatnot. But it's worth, you know, revisiting some of the the biggest storylines for this Houston Rockets season. Then we'll also tackle the interesting questions regarding the futures of both Eric Gordon and KJ Martin after some reporting by the Athletics Kelly Eco, and we're going to revisit those topics in segments 2 and 3. But here on the uh, on the outset what I'd like to do is just kind of set the expectations for what is, you know, what can we come to expect from Rockets Media Day. So this is how it's going to work. Media Day is from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Central Time. It's at Toyota Center. Basically, all the local Houston Rockets media that you have come to know and love, uh, myself included or possibly not included. If you just like, if you're like hate listening to the show, then whatever. No, but everybody that you you know, all the all the usual media suspects will be there uh, in attendance, and it, it'll be asked. We'll be asking questions to General Manager Rafael Stone, to Rockets head coach Steven Silas, as well as select players. We don't know the players ahead of time, but we can almost you know assuredly guarantee that we'll get guys like Jalen Green, KPJ, Jabari will more than likely talk. Al P will probably talk. The you know, the majority of the big names on the roster will talk. It's not every player made available on the roster, but most of the names that fans and, and media want to talk to and, and discuss things with, with will be made available. Uh, so again, we'll have probably a list. As soon as I get to Toyota Center, usually there's a, a, a printed out list of who is going to be on the docket for the day. And so I'll be sure to try and share that on, on Twitter as soon as that gets out there. There will not be a Zoom element for media day. So me, media do have to be attending in person. The Rockets are doing away with Zoom access this season, uh, but they are bringing back locker room access, which is really, really exciting because that's where you get some more, you know, kind of candid interviews. You get real kind of journalism work being done by the the local beat reporters and and you know media members who can kind of start building and harboring relationships with the players in a more relaxed atmosphere rather than you know they're being brought up to the podium after the game for a Zoom press conference and there's very little you know side interaction if you will between between players and media so that should be a fun element, you know, kind of bring, being brought back to the media landscape of things for this year in particular, and obviously moving forward. Now, as far as other, other expectations for media day, I, I will say that I think that some of the things that we can come to expect will be, you know, we're, we're going to get a lot of, you know, hey, we're excited for the year. You know, this is what we've worked on, you know, talking to general manager Rafael Stone. He'll probably, you know, discuss optimism for the roster, optimism for the draft picks, things of that nature. I'm curious to find out from Steven Silas kind of what 
you know, his expectations are for his brand new assistant coaching staff, kind of what some of the expectations have been for guys over the summer, things that they've been working on. Those are just kind of some of the topics that we'll, we'll wind up tackling. I mean, it's going to be a variety of different questions being lobbed and, We'll probably get some some interesting tidbits about, again, what specific players have been working on, what the coaching staff has asked of specific players, maybe some insight into how Steven Silas plans to utilize certain guys on the roster, players that he may or may not be leaning on in the early going of the season, things of that nature. But it's worth noting that some of the biggest storylines right going into this rocket season I, I just I wanted to sit here and kind of just hammer them all out because there's basically I tried to sit here and walk through all the different storylines that I could think of uh that we've been discussing for the past two to three months really over the summer uh and this is kind of what I more or less what I came up with so is this the make or break year for Steven Silas right and and by extension of that what what do we hear out of him, you know, at this press conference? What are what are his thoughts and emotions heading into this season, his confidence level, his optimism, all of that? And again, is this the make or break year for him, right? What does Steven Siles have to show us? What does he have to show the front office to cement himself as, you know, the long-term coach of the Houston Rockets rather than this potentially being his last year or worst case scenario, this year being cut short if things are you know, go, go sideways early on in the season, like they did last year with a, you know, a potential 15 game losing streak. Uh, what about Kevin Porter Jr., right? Between those two guys, between Steven Silas and KPJ, the, those are two very important years for both of those guys for completely different reasons, right? For KPJ, this is a contract year. This is his chance to prove that he can be a point guard and, and that he deserves to be a point guard at the NBA level. This is his chance. The Rockets, you know, have committed a lot to him. They've invested a lot in him. So what kind of a year does he have, right? Does he impress? And do you walk away from, at the end of the season thinking, yeah, KPJ is the point guard of the future. He looks great with Jalen Green. He checks all the boxes that he needs to check. Or do you walk away with, you know, more questions than we had going into the season? Do you walk away thinking maybe he's not a point guard? Maybe he's best served as a sixth man or, you know, back in more of his natural position as a two or a three on the floor. A lot of questions for KPJ for this season. What has Jalen Green worked on this offseason, right? What steps has he taken to further improve his game and how big of a leap is he going to take in his second year? How much will the addition of Jabari Smith Jr. elevate the Houston Rockets defense? And what are Steven Silas' expectations for how to bring him along, right? Is he brought along a bit more slowly? Is he made a focal point of what the Houston Rockets are trying to do? What did Alperin Shingun and Usman Garuba learn uh, from playing overseas in Eurobasket, both just against that competition over there, which was some very high level basketball being played. What did they learn about playing against each other? That's going to be fun to ask them and try and find out uh, about, you know, what was it like? They, They have a history. They've played against each other before, but now they're teammates. And again, even revisiting that game, you know, Turkey against Spain, there were moments where those two got a little, you know, maybe not chippy with each other, but they were having some fun out there going at each other head to head. So it'll be interesting to see, to hear, hear and see from both of those guys what it was like competing against each other now that they're actually teammates on the same team in the NBA. Uh, who will be the Rockets' fifth starter? That's been a gigantic question, right? Is it going to be Eric Gordon? Is it going to be Jay Sean Tate? I kind of doubt that Steven Silas is going to reveal who's going to be his fifth starter you know, at media day, but at the same time, we might be able to pick up on a few nuggets here and there about his plans for the lineups, things that he anticipates that he's going to do with certain players on the roster, that kind of thing. Uh, will Tari Eason and Ty Ty Washington be in the rotation early on, or are they going to be sent down to the G League, right? That's another one. You know, how how quickly or how slowly will those two guys be brought along into the mix? There's a safe assumption that Jabari Smith Jr. will be, you know, a, a featured part of the Houston Rockets lineup. But for the other two, what happens with them, right? Are they just, are they saddled to the Rockets bench and they're just going to stick with the team? Or are they going to be sent down to the G League with the expectation of, hey, we want you guys to get some extensive run down there at the G League level? So, ton of questions, you know, regarding this Houston Rockets team, and I doubt we get answers to all of them, but I think we will get answers to some of them, and there will be some some things that we can kind of extrapolate from some of the answers that we are given. I will say that I, I do think that uh, I'm going to call it right now, and I'm going to oh, one more question here. What is going on with Willie Colley Stein? Right, like we were we. We we got news of the Willie Colley Stein signing, and then the Rockets rolled out their official training camp roster, and all the Mavericks players from the Christian Wood trade are on the training camp roster. So there's no sign 
anywhere of Willie Colley Stein currently. Now, maybe that changes. Maybe Willie Colley Stein, maybe one of the, you know, Mavericks players gets waived and Willie Colley Stein gets brought in for actual training camp. Maybe that news drops as early as Monday morning. Who knows? We will find out. Um, but that's kind of another big question, right? And it'll be curious to see whether or not that gets addressed in media day. But I will say, I'm calling it right now. Uh, or not, maybe not. You know what? I'm going to call it, but I also want your opinion. Who's going to drop the best media day quote? That's what I want to know, right? Is it going to be Jalen Green? Is he going to have like some fantastic, awesome quote that Rockets fans are going to, you know, fall in love with about his competitive spirit, his drive to be better, whatever? Is it going to be Jalen Green? Is Alper and Shingoon going to walk away like the star of Houston Rockets media day? Is he just going to jump up on the mic and kill it like a comedian? I don't know, right? I, I'm going to put my money safely on Alper and Shingoon with a potential dark horse of being of uh, of Josh Christopher because Josh Christopher is great behind the mic. He's great interacting with the media. He's such an incredible personality. So those would be the two guys that I'd place you know my my money on as far as. Uh, you know, who might have, who might walk away, you know, the, the winner of media day with the best quotes or the funniest quote, coolest quote, whatever, whatever, whatever have you. Uh, last thing here, if you were given the opportunity to ask somebody at Rockets media day, Silas Stone, one of the players, a question, what would you want to ask them? Drop your question in the comments on the YouTube page and a certain somebody who might be in attendance may or may not if the question's good enough, opt to use said question. So drop it in the YouTube comments. I will read through those. And if I find any ones that I really, really like, I may actually partake and use that. And then you can uh, you know, claim credit for it whenever it hits the Twitter airwaves. But with that coming up, oh, and I will have uh, all the all the you know media availabilities and everything for the Houston Rockets. They might be they might broadcast it live on Rockets.com or like on the Facebook page or something. They did do that last year, I believe. Um, so that might be a possibility as well to tune in and watch live. Uh, I, obviously, as soon as I find out, I will share that information. But right now, I do not know the answer to that. And then on top of that, uh, after the fact, I will be publishing all of the footage for, from Silas, Stone, the players, everything to uh, my own new dedicated YouTube page for Rockets Media content. So it's a separate YouTube page from the Locked On YouTube page. Unfortunately, I want to keep those two things separate. The Locked On page is just for Locked on shows, you know, LOR, all that good stuff. I have a separate YouTube page that I will include the link to in the description for the episode. That's where I'll post all the pre and post game media availabilities, any media events, any anything that we do talking to and or about the Houston Rockets will get posted there for your consumption later on. So with that coming up, I do want to talk about KJ Martin and Eric Gordon and their futures as Houston Rockets as per a recent article by the Athletics Kelly Eco. We're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your football betting and info this season. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every single game that you can find. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every single sport out there. That's right. They've got you covered for MLB postseason. NBA is right around the corner. They've got you for all your fighting odds, UFC, MMA, boxing, you name it. They've got you covered over at BetOnline. Right now, you can run over to BetOnline to take a look at who the odds-on favorites are for the NBA championship this season. Right now, the Golden State Warriors now leading the pack at plus 575 after all the drama with the Boston Celtics, who are still in second place at plus 600. You got the Milwaukee Bucks in third at plus 700. And then rounding out the top five favorites, you got the Brooklyn Nets and the LA Clippers at plus 750 apiece. So for all of that and more odds, head over to Bet Online to learn more about the trends in action available to you. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Let's talk a little bit about Eric Gordon, because Eric Gordon has been kind of this big question mark for the Houston Rockets for a while now. And Kelly Eco recently published a piece for The Athletic in which he discussed that currently, as it stands, Eric Gordon and his future with the Houston Rockets is a bit uncertain because he wants clarity on his situation. Now, what does clarity mean for Eric Gordon? Kelly highlighted the fact that it basically means one of two options, either an extension to keep Eric Gordon around for the long term, or a trade to a contender. Now, so far, 
throughout Rafael Stone's tenure, he has acquiesced to every single request that a player has thrown his way, right? He has traded, and, and I'm not just saying like just gotten rid of them. I'm saying he has sent players wherever they've wanted to go, right? What he is, he has gone through and through to trying to help players get to their desired destinations, all of that, while at the same time still benefiting the Houston Rockets, right? Sent P.J. Tucker to his desired location. Sent James Harden to where he wanted to go. Sent Victor Oladipo to where he wanted to go. He has continually taken care of his players. He waived Ben McLemore and Boogie Cousins so that they could go sign with their respective teams that they wanted to go sign with. Throughout all of this, Eric Gordon and the my understanding of his role within this organization, that he's been happy. He's been content with his role. And he has bought into this idea of being the Rockets veteran, right? Being the guy who is around to help kind of stabilize the rebuilding process and be the veteran leadership, the mentorship, the locker room voice, all of that for this young group of Houston Rockets. And that's been fantastic. But put yourself in EG's shoes for a second, right? Even if he is entirely bought into this idea, this identity, he's effectively going into what is a contract year because he's got one more year on his, you know, pretty pretty substantial payroll of almost $20 million. And past that, the Rockets, this next offseason, they could just kick him to the curb if they wanted to. So if you're a player going into a contract year, you want future long-term security, right? And you just want to understand where that is. And so right now, I'm sure EG is thinking, all right, if I'm on this Houston Rockets team and if I'm still bought into this, you know, dynamic, this role, whatever, I'm not really going to be able to showcase myself the way I need to because the ball needs to be in the hands of Jalen Green and KPJ and Jabari and LP. And like, he's kind of an afterthought, right? He's just out there to babysit the kids, if you will, oftentimes when he's on the floor. So he's not really going to be able to get his, get his quote unquote if he's on this Rockets team, which means he can't really play up to his value on a contract year. And this is probably EG's last chance to secure a big contract. Now, the opposite of that is if he gets traded to a contender, then that contender, there's a reasonable assumption that that contender will heavily rely on EG's services, talking, you know, 30 plus minutes a night, a, uh, you know, a premier role, either big time, you know, supercharged six man sub coming off the bench or possibly a starting role on, you know, select teams here or there that might need his services. And that allows EG to compete and vie for a big, a, another big contract, likely the, the last big contract of EG's career. So I respect the position that he's in and I respect him wanting some level of clarity moving forward from the Houston Rockets organization. I've largely sat in the, in the camp of, don't trade Eric Gordon. I basically boiled it down to that. If, if all you're going to do is trade Eric Gordon and all you're getting back is effectively a late first round draft pick in this next year's draft, 2023, I just don't know if that's worth it. And that's not even getting into the arguments of, you know, are you, are you also subsequently having to take back, you know, additional bad money? Is it, a, is it another, you know, expiring contract effectively? Because the way EG's contract is currently situated, there's a lot of financial flexibility. There's a lot of future cap flexibility with it. There are a lot of options with how things are currently set up with Eric Gordon. You can affect you effectively had two trade deadlines to potentially flip him, deal him, see what's out there, or just you know keep him around for the long haul and see what's up. Now, if I were the Houston Rockets, I honestly would entertain extending Eric Gordon, but it would have to be with the caveat of two things. One, it would not be at the at his current dollar value. Like he's not making another contract where he's making, you know, an average annual value of like 18, 19, 20 million a year. That's not happening. It would have to be something that is slightly more than the current market value of what is the MLE. So I mean, you you could maybe have the starting rate somewhere around 12ish, you know, 11, 12 million a year, something like that because otherwise EG could just want to, you know, want to walk away in free agency and go get, uh, you know, an MLE with any team anywhere. So you've got to up the value a little bit to make, to give some incentive for him to want to stay because I don't think he'd get much more. I don't think he's going to get like a $15 million a year contract out on the open market. That's just, he's not at that stage in his career. Nobody's trying to pay 33, 34 year old EG that amount of money. But if you're the Rockets and if you want to start being good as early as next season, Having Eric Gordon, having a stable veteran like that on your roster who can kind of 
shore up your guard rotation, who can fill in in, in pinch spots here and there. Again, 20, 25 minutes a night this season, probably going to get anywhere, anywhere from 25-ish or so minutes a night. And again, I have him painted as the starting three for this Houston Rockets team, much to the chagrin of lots of people everywhere. But that's what I assume is going to happen this season as far as the rotations are concerned. Having Eric Gordon in your guard rotation alongside a Jalen Green and a KPJ, assuming things work out with KPJ and a Josh Christopher, having those three, those four guys as your guard rotation, that's an incredibly solid guard rotation to have. The one detrimental thing about that is you are distinctly lacking in legitimate point guards, right? Or or legitimate point guard play, unless KPJ's year is just transcendent and he's like, all right, yeah, he's the point guard of the future. He looks phenomenal. Then maybe you can get away with 12 minutes a night where KPJ's not on the floor and you just rely on some combination of Jalen Green, Eric Gordon, Josh Christopher, Shingoon, Jay Sean Tate, whatever, playmaking by committee, if you will. So that's the one issue that I do that I can see with it, right? Is those are four guys who all really like having the ball in their hands. They're bucket getters. They're score first, you know, mentality type guys. And that could be problematic further down the line. But I do like the idea, again, with the caveat of if EG is bought into the idea of getting his last big contract, maybe it's like a two plus one, you know, team option on the final year kind of thing, uh, or maybe even a three plus one, whatever, you know, with a, you know, relatively team friendly deal for a guy that can provide his services again, around 11, 12 million a year give or take, so three and 30, three for 36, four for 48, possibly, something like that. I'm all for it, as long as EG understands that as he ages out of that contract, his role will slowly start to probably diminish here with the Houston Rockets. That's not to say it's going to become non-existent, but if EG then next season gets moved to the bench, right, and he becomes the Rockets, like, veteran sixth man off the bench, then, you know, there might be some nights where he gets, you know, 15 minutes of burn, and the rest of the young guys are, are doing just fine, and he's good, right? There might be some nights where they rely heavily on him. If he's got it going, if he's drilling buckets left and right, and they're really, you know, plugging away for some wins, then maybe he gets 25-plus minutes, 30-plus minutes on any given night. If he understands that his role is to be kind of TBD at that point where they lock him into the contract, they're like, hey, we want you to feel comfortable. We want you here for the long haul. We want you bought into this rebuild, and we want you around when this team is trying to be good again and on the upswing. I'm with that. I love that idea completely, but it's all dependent on if EG can accept that role, right? If he can transition a bit more into a role as more of a true blue, like 3 and D wing rather than a you know, score first mentality guard who needs the ball in his hands to be effective or who potentially wants the ball in his hands to be effective, then I like that idea. And so I'm all for it. I, you know, I, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's necessarily pressure from EG to be traded to a contender. That's not the understanding that I've had about his situation at all. He's not upset about his role. He doesn't, he's not begging to, you know, go play competitive basketball. He just wants clarity moving forward. So I do think that's you know, the, the Rockets owe that much to him, right? EG has been a huge part of this franchise, and I do think he deserves some level of clarity and, and, you know, just concrete, you know, answers about what his role is moving forward rather than being left kind of in limbo as to whether or not, you know, he's going to be around for much longer than this season or if he's going to get dealt, what have you, all that stuff. So with that, Final thing on the docket that I want to talk about is one KJ Martin and his future with the Houston Rockets. We're going to talk about that in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Let's talk a little KJ Martin, Kenyon Martin Jr. It's such an unfortunate situation with KJ because he truly has flashed a ton of potential with the Rockets. And there have been moments where he's looked really, really good with this team. But building off of what Kelly Eco discussed in his article about Eric Gordon, he also mentioned that he predicts, predicts, can't talk, that K.J. Martin will be dealt before preseason. That is, like, that is a really bold prediction. And it's, it's not like Kelly to just take, like spaghetti and throw it at the wall and hope something will stick. I have to assume that this is pot, you know, coming from somewhere, you know, either some, some Intel and an assumption that something may happen, what have you. And it makes a lot of sense because with where the Houston Rockets are at with the roster crunch that they're currently under with all the young talent that they have, there's just not enough minutes to go around, right? We went through this thought exercise last week when we did our rotations episode with Paolo Alves, we discussed KJ Martin's future with Alicon. It's there are 
no sure. Sh- there, there, there is there is such a roster crunch going on right now with this Houston Rockets team to where you you really can't run a 10, 11, 12 man rotation throughout the regular season. You just can't do it. it it's it's basically impossible. So for KJ, he's had two years now in a Houston Rockets jersey. And throughout those two years, I, I will say he's improved I, I, uh, some, but from where he was, from where he started, he, he, he grew, he got better. He's, you know, got all the potential, this gigantic sky high ceiling, right? He could be potentially down the line, like a premier three and D type wing or like energy wing where you just come in and he crashes the glass and he's got this like superior bounce. And there's, there's nobody else on the Rockets roster that can do what he does right now. Currently, like the closest you get is Jalen green and Jalen green, stylistically completely different type of player. KJ can get in there can get in the paint, can live amongst the land of the trees because he's got that insane bounce, that insane second jump, can rebound, can crash the glass, both offensively, defensively. And then on offense, he sticks to his role, right? He sets screens, he pops out to the three-point line, he rolls hard to the rim. Sometimes he'll attack a little bit and get up to that little, like, scoop layup shot that he does. But for the most part, he stays in his lane. And he he does, pardon me, he does what the team asks of him, and he does it relatively well. For his role. But if you look up and down the Houston Rockets roster at the wings, the players that are effectively ahead of KJ Martin in the rotation from a talent perspective and from an expectation perspective as to who is actually going to get minutes this season, KJ is just, he finds himself at the bottom of of both lists realistically. I think from a talent perspective, if you just put in, in a vacuum KJ Martin next to the other like legitimate forwards on the team or wings on the team, Right, KJ Martin versus Jay Sean Tate. Jay Sean Tate is the better basketball player. He is. And there, there is zero argument in favor of KJ Martin in that regard. The only edge that KJ Martin has, KJ Martin has two edges, and they're significant edges, right? He can shoot better currently than Jay Sean Tate, but we've also seen it on a very small sample size. We haven't seen it consistently enough for me to think, all right, well, if he were suddenly made a starter and got 25 plus minutes a night, would he be able to keep that consistency from beyond the arc? So there's that. And then he's got the insane hops, right? He's got the athleticism. So there's that. Past that, Jay Sean Tate is a far superior all-around basketball player. He's a night and day better defender. He's a better ball handler. He's a better creator. He's better at creating his own offense. It's, again, night and day difference comparing those two guys. Even Tari Eason right now, who is a incredibly raw rookie, I would, in a vacuum, take over KJ Martin, all things considered. So it's unfortunate because it feels like there could be something there with KJ Martin, and this could be like that first, I don't want to call it a mistake during the Rafael Stone era, but this could be that first decision that gets made, right? Where effectively the Rockets, it feels like they're kind of choosing between KJ Martin or Jay Sean Tate, and they're, they chose Jay Sean Tate, right? They extended him. They wanted to keep him around. They value what he brings to, to both on the court as well as what he brings to the Rockets locker room. They, they view him as kind of one of their veteran presences on the team, even though he's only going into his third NBA season. He is older than the rest of the young guys. And he can kind of be that guy that bridges the gap a little bit between legitimate veterans and the young guys on this roster. So for all those reasons, they value Jay Sean Tate heavily. And again, for KJ Martin, he's had two years and he's improved in certain areas, but there's other areas where it's just like, where's the growth, right? He hasn't really improved much as a ball handler. I mean, it's gotten a little bit better, but he still looks shaky to where I I don't know if I could trust him as a full-time wing, You know, he's basically, he's too small to play the power forward full-time. He doesn't, you know, doesn't have enough, a good enough handle to be the wing full-time. I don't know if his shot consistency would, you know, extrapolate to large volume. You know, if he were to get 25 plus minutes a night, there's a lot of question marks about KJ's future. And if the Rockets do move on from him, what, what can they even get from him, right? Or what can they even get for him? I should say they paid you know, a hefty price tag to pick up the, what was it, 52nd overall pick from the Sacramento Kings. They outright bought the pick a few years back and drafted KJ Martin in the first place. So they didn't trade anything other than cash to get KJ Martin, to get that 52nd, 52nd uh, overall pick. So what can you now net for KJ Martin, right? Can you maybe get a late first for him? Possibly, maybe, from a team that's really desperate that wants an infusion of young talent. Possibly, maybe you get a pair of seconds further down the line. I'd be content, potentially, at this point with a high second-round pick, like something that is guaranteed to land 31 through 35. Maybe you hit up 
you know, the Magic or the Pacers or the Jazz, and you find, God, sending KJ Martin to the Jazz feels dirty, but maybe you find a team like that, right? A team that is guaranteed to be so bad this season that they're going to land somewhere in the top five in the second round because that's effectively almost a late first, and you walk away and you're content with that. Maybe you get really, really creative with how you deal KJ Martin, right? Maybe you do a deal similar to what the Rockets did with PJ Tucker, where they floated Milwaukee's own pick back their way and got a better overall, got a better overall pick from it, from the same team. Maybe you do something like that this year because the Rockets outright own Milwaukee's pick. Maybe you revisit the Milwaukee Bucks and say, hey, want to, you know, roll this pick around a little bit further, right? Maybe you could package some deal like this year's 2023 first and KJ Martin back to Milwaukee for, a th- another future first that's like lottery protected or top 20 protected or something like that. And then you increase the overall value of that asset by also pushing the can further down the road, kicking the can further down the line, getting creative with stuff like that. Another point to bring up here possibly is the fact that reportedly uh, Jay Crowder is seeking a trade away from the Phoenix Suns and isn't going to be a part of the Phoenix Suns team. He had a tweet sometime this last week where he said, he quote tweeted something and basically said, 99, not going to be here. (laughs) And he deleted it almost immediately, but the screenshots live on forever. And now Shams is reporting that Jay Crowder is not going to report to training camp, that the Suns are seeking a trade for him. Maybe there's a permutation there where the Rockets bring in Jay Crowder as their new veteran force, if you will, and they trade some combo potentially of Eric Gordon and KJ Martin for, I don't know, Jay Crowder, Dario Saric, and, you know, a future first from the sun, something that's further out than 2023. I, I don't know. And, and maybe if it's in that, if it's a trade some somewhere along those lines, then maybe it's a little bit more palatable moving Eric Gordon at that point. If you're bringing back another veteran force in a guy like Jay Crowder, uh, a guy who maybe sticks into his lane a little bit better, gives the Rockets a bit more size at that three spot. Possibly there's a lot of, there's some pros and cons there, but you know, something along those lines, right? Where maybe you get creative and you deal KJ and Eric Gordon in a package together to a team to up the overall value. And then you get back, you know, potentially maybe another young guy, maybe, you know, another young prospect, future draft capital, something to that degree. But as it stands right now, it does feel like KJ Martin has been the odd man out all summer. He was the guy who wasn't showing up to voluntary workouts. We had the situation earlier this summer where Kenyon Martin Sr. wanted his son to have a bigger role, and there was a discussion about what his role would be like moving forward with this Houston Rockets team, a candid conversation about his role and you know whether or not there'd be a, a cemented role for him in the lineup. And very clearly, the Rockets were drafting one of the three bigs at the top of the draft, and it happened to be Jabari Smith Jr., and he plays KJ's position effectively. So he cuts into any and all minutes that KJ Martin could potentially receive on this Rockets team. So... Will K.J. Martin be dealt before the Rockets' first preseason game? Is he going to go through training camp with the Rockets? Is he going to even report to training camp for the Houston Rockets, right? Is he going to be in Lake Charles with the rest of the team? Honestly, no idea. It's going to be really curious to see how that situation pans out, what those interviews potentially look like with K.J., all of that. But, of course, we'll have you covered for all of that and more right here at Locked on Rockets. Again, I will be in Lake Charles for all three days of training camp. It should be a ton of fun. We'll have all the interviews, all the news, notes, analysis, everything coming out of training camp throughout those three days. And again, I'll post all the interviews where I can on the new dedicated YouTube page. But as always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.